This is from Stanton Friedman's website. There have been a number of studies published showing that stage fission and fusion deep space propulsion systems are capable of round trips to nearby stars in a shorter time than an average lifespan. I don't know what journals of physics these were published in, but most likely they are in the DC or Marvel journals of astrophysics. The idea that one can get to the nearest stars and back in a human lifespan using nuclear power is absolutely preposterous. As can easily be shown, such systems are simply nonsense when examined in the light of presently known principles of physics. First off, we're not going to another star butt naked. Rather, we'd need, at minimum, a support vehicle big enough to house quite a few people and all their equipment. We'll guess that a craft of 100,000 metric tons will do the trick minimally. That's the size of a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier. The kinetic energy of 100,000 metric tons moving at one-tenth light velocity is 4.47 times 10 to the 22nd joules. The energy output from the ideal fusion of two deuterium nuclei into an alpha particle is 3.82 times 10 to the negative 12 joules. So dividing that into the total energy needed requires that we fuse minimally before we even touch Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation. 2.34 times 10 to the 34th deuterium nuclei, which in turn is about 782 metric tons of deuterium. That doesn't seem like much compared to the 100,000 metric tons of the craft we are propelling, but we have now to deal with Tsiolkovsky. When a rocket accelerates at the beginning, most of the energy goes off with the exhaust that we're pushing off on. So we have to apply to Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation and see what amount of fuel we'll really need. We need to know the velocity of the exhaust. Since we have the energy per fusion already, we can plunk that into a kinetic energy equation and see what the velocity of an alpha particle could be, ideally, if all that fusion energy goes into propelling it. M will be the mass of an alpha particle. Rearranging the equation and solving for V, we get 3.39 times 10 to the 7th meters per second which is 0.113 of light velocity, more than a tenth of light speed. Now we can stick our numbers into one of those online Java uplets that do Tsiolkovsky's equation, and we find that we need about 140,000 metric tons of deuterium to get us to one-tenth light speed. That's more than the mass of the craft. Our multiplier is then 2.4 times the mass of the payload to get the mass of the payload plus the propellant. But we're not finished yet. When we get there, we have to stop. So we have to take the 240,000 metric tons as the initial payload and figure out what it will take in propellant to get all that to one-tenth light speed. Then, when we get to top speed, will have enough gas left to slow to a stop. All we have to do is multiply 240,000 metric tons by 2.4 and we get our answer. It's 576,000 metric tons total. So initially we need 476,000 metric tons of deuterium to go from a dead stop to one-tenth light velocity and back to a dead stop. That's quite a bit of deuterium, isn't it? But getting that much isn't the killer problem. As naughty as that is, the real problem is the rate at which the deuterium is to be burned. In the first half of the trip, we have to burn 336 million kilograms of deuterium. Let's say we burn it up in one year. 
that is, at the end of the first year, were going one-tenth light velocity. There are 31,536,000 seconds in a year, so we divide this time into the amount of fuel to be burned and get 10.65 kilograms of deuterium per second. Now we can calculate the amount of energy let loose per second. 3.34 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms is the mass of a deuterium nucleus. 3.82 times 10 to the negative 12 joules is the amount of energy released per fusion of two deuterium nuclei. So we divide the 10.65 kilograms by 3.34 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms to get the number of deuterium nuclei. Then divide that by two to get the number of reactions which produce the 3.82 times 10 to the negative 12 joules each. And the total amount of energy per second released is then 6.09 times 10 to the 15th joules per second, or in newspeak, 6,090 terajoules per second. Now, the Hiroshima bomb went off at 63 terajoules, so dividing that into 6,090, we get 96 Hiroshima-type bombs per second going off in our engine. Do you really think this is a possible rational solution to space travel? Does anyone in their right mind think that any conceivable engine could contain a power output of 96 atomic bombs per second for 31 million seconds? And that's only the first half of the trip. Back to the drawing board, Stan.